Welcome to the Friday edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 496. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and the day is March the 22nd, 2019. Welcome to another show, ladies and gentlemen. I'm glad you're here to, to watch the three of us pontificate about whatever we care to talk about. And there's lots out there. Before we get started, we want you to subscribe, like, comment, share, tweet, retweet, do whatever you need to do to get the, the Anglican Unscripted show out there in social media and to your friends. And uh, we really appreciate it. I think we had 85 comments in the last episode. That was awesome. They're fun to read. We're finally getting our first trolls. Isn't that cool? We... <laughs> The comments were just uh, not full of trolls, but uh, two or three of you just hung in there and said, I'm going to make my point. And we do appreciate that. And uh, all are invited to comment and have an opinion. And, you know, that's something we're going to talk about uh, in this episode is uh, discussions. Before we get there, I want to talk a little bit about fundraising. Um, in the past, Anglican Unscripted and Anglican TV have kind of existed in a vacuum. When we needed money, we asked for money, and you were, you were gracious in giving us money. You sent us to GAFCON three times. Uh, you provided equipment, this wonderful little studio, little cameras and microphones that get to send to co-host, and we really appreciate that. But I need to kind of separate uh, in the future giving, because Gavin has a separate ministry from Anglican Unscripted, and I it behooves us to support that as well. So in the show notes, and we'll talk more about this at the end of the episode, I'm going to have a separate link where we go and uh, give money to support Gavin and his diocese and his ministry. And if George ever needs money in the future, we'll also have a link to his. And it's important that you support all three of us in this. Yes, you get to watch Unscripted, but Gavin's in England, and he's doing a, a ministry besides Anglican Unscripted. And George is down in the in the swamps of Florida, and his his ministries are different than than Anglican TV as a whole. So we will kind of find a way to divide up how to give what <clears throat> to whom, um, and we'll do that at the end of the show. Let's move on and talk about what's happening in the news. And you know, for a, a person who in 1984 got to read the book 1984 as my senior uh, thesis in, in high school, um, it really had an effect on me that, you know, it can get bad if you don't pay attention. And that, you know, this world around us can slowly devolve. And your role in that society, if you don't pay attention, will devolve as well. And all of a sudden, these things you never thought could happen, happen happens uh, uh, certainly in the book Animal Farm as well. And I thought we would talk about this because I see people like Jordan Peterson. Uh, there's this uh, great uh, uh, journalist, a Catholic journalist in England who's also had a rough week. And I thought we could talk a little bit about that. And maybe the death of academia, the death of Westernism, the def death of our culture is going to be today's topic. George, can you tell me a little bit about what happened to Jordan and, and Carolyn Farrell? Jordan Peterson, the University of Toronto professor, noted psychologist, and probably the most prominent popular intellectual in the world today, English-speaking world today, um, was invited by acquaintances at the Faculty of Divinity at Cambridge to apply for a two-month visiting fellowship. And he thought, why not? Uh, I, this would be interesting, enable me to move my next stage of research. And this fellowship was awarded, and then it was rescinded after protests by members of the faculty claiming that students needed to be protected from Jordan Peterson, that he didn't really uh, have the... Uh, he was dangerous. Um, and... Then that same week, Carolyn Farrow, who writes for the Catholic Herald in the UK, uh, she had been on TV earlier in the year on a discussion of the transgender issue with a woman who had a son who now believes she's a, the son believes he's a girl. And in a 
Twitter exchange afterwards, uh, Carolyn Farrell referred to the child as a boy, his biological genetic uh, designation, not his newly chosen identity as a girl. Well, the woman filed a police complaint, calling this discrimination and violating civil rights rules and everything. And Carolyn Farrow, a mother of five, finds herself under investigation by the Surrey police for the crime of calling a boy who thinks he's a girl a boy. Gavin. Two Gavin. Two different police forces, yes. Gavin. That's thought police. Yes. That's 1984. It, it, it really is. Um, one of the things that I, I've been following the Jordan Peterson thing very carefully. And um, he had, a, he had a, it's on the back of a very successful visit to, uh, to Cambridge where he spoke to the union. We have a, a union address. He did it in both Oxford and Cambridge. It was, he had one of the biggest turnouts they've ever had. And uh, he was invited. They invited him. They said, we'd like to make a closer link with you. So then the kickback from the left happened and without him, he, he discovered it on Twitter that he'd been disinvited. Uh, and um, this morning, a, a, a Cambridge spokeswoman stood up and said, um, he doesn't share our values, he can't come. Uh, I, I put out a, a tweet to try and condense what I thought was at the heart of this. So if it, on the grounds that inclusion is actually a Marxist word, <laughs> anyone using it is 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 trying to support marxist culture and so i said w the word inclusive means cultural marxist so when a cambridge spokeswoman explained why jordan peterson was uninvited she meant cambridge is a marxist environment and there's no place here for anyone who can't uphold our marxist principles well of course there isn't that's what marxism does what we hadn't realized was that that cambridge had become a Marxist environment, as to some extent, uh, much of the rest of society has. That we have been bamboozled all this time by the linguistic slate of hands, the words inclusion, tolerance, diversity. But these don't mean what they meant. They mean 1984, as Kevin said, thought police. And for someone like Carolyn Farrow, who was visited by two police forces, so London is being overwhelmed by knife crime. Mrs. May d d presided over the loss of about 20,000 policemen on the front line, I think. Sadiq, Sadiq Khan can do nothing about knife crime. And in the middle of all this, the police have been so uh, overwhelmed by the propaganda of Stonewall that they're willing to send two police forces to investigate a Catholic journalist who believes that biology takes precedence over over mental maps george 1966 67 60 all the way through the mid 70s the university campus was a place of free speech it was a place where you could march down the the, the middle of the campus and protest war and smoke your marijuana and uh do your lsd and have free sex and do all the the things that culture didn't want you to do because that was an expression of the university well, that, that was, was california <laughs> that's san francisco <laughs> but I, it, I, I, I i know stuff like that happened but not when i was in college <laughs> that was san francisco um but the the universities were a place where you could go and have open debate open discussion you know have access to stuff you didn't get back in middle school and high school and all that has really changed in this last you know 20 30 years in a horrible way to as gavin discusses the marxism here the 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 closing down of any thought the the banning of books that may offend people the uh the interrogation of those who aren't thinking correctly so much so that president trump this week had to sign an executive order saying that we have to be very careful what universities get our funds because we want to be sure they enforce the free speech that they have so spoken of all of these years a lot has changed george yes and no uh, a lot has changed in the sense that the situation has become much much worse much darker much more coercive much more compelled but the roots have been there for 30 40 years i 
I benefited from a very nice, very good education. I've got a lovely resume. I studied at Duke and Yale and Oxford at the University of Pennsylvania. I sat under the feet of René Girard and uh, Philip Berrigan. Um, uh, I studied the Pro Old Testament prophets under Philip Berrigan, the Roman Catholic uh, scholar, and Brevard Childs was my thesis advisor. And that generation is well and truly dead. Academia is a... <clears throat> When I, when I was a little boy, my father owned a factory on the Schuylkill River. Next to our factory was a plating works, next to that a tire factory, next to that a chemical plant owned by Armand Hammer. And the Schuylkill River was dead. You, you, you could, that body of water which emptied into Philadelphia had no life in it whatsoever. The universities are like the Schuylkill River in the 1970s. Sure. The acid rain, the uh, pour off from the plating works and the tire works and the uh, chemical factory have so destroyed the atmosphere that we still see the river, we still see the spires of Oxford, and there's still people milling about and students attending lectures, but there's no life, there's no intellectual freedom, there is nothing. My studies have, and since I left school, withdrew from the higher education, have had nothing to do with academia because academia is a dead end. Kevin, I'd like to extend that. Uh, sure. Uh, George, that's a very good metaphor, a very profound one. Uh, and that dead river has now spilled over in right down the chain to primary schools. So one of the things I've done this week, and I, I want to talk about a guy who served me in a stationery store as an example of what we're dealing with. Um, in, in our country at the moment, the, the left have provided a sex and education program which will be imposed on primary school children, that's children between 5 and 11, to teach them about LGBT relationships and, um, and gender diversity uh, and gender dysphoria. There are two problems. One is it is prepubescence, and I'll explain why that matters in a second. And the other is that parents will no longer have a right to remove their children from it. In other words, the state is really stepping up in terms of saying, we have more authority over your family than you do. Now, the reason this sexualization of children matters is because all the studies show that if you introduce children to sexualized categories too early, it causes them psychological distress and damage. And you cannot discuss homosexual relationships without discussing the romantic and erotic element. If Kevin was my very best friend and we, didn't, we weren't romantically or sexually attracted to each other, it wouldn't be a gay relationship. But if we are romantically and sexually attracted to each other, it would. So you then need to explain what we want to do to each other to, to define that relationship. And that's what this sex ed program does. Now, the Jewish community in this country and the Muslim community have woken up to this movement from the Marxist left and are fighting it. And I was given the opportunity by a new group called the Family of the, uh, the Values Foundation, run by Orthodox Jews in London, to have access to a House of Lords Select Committee this week. That was wonderful. I went into the Palace of Westminster. Uh, we went up into the House of Lords committee room. It's terribly effective. And there I was asked to explain why the House of Lords Select Committee should examine the statutory instruments that Commons had sent up and reject this particular one. The Lords listened to me and they said, can you go away and as quick as you can put that into a paper, no more than three sides long, and we will circulate it amongst all the, the Lords we know. Now, there are two problems. The, the scale of this thing is enormous. One is, because it's Brexit, the Lords are in receipt of 700 statutory instruments they've got to scrutinise, and they don't have the time and the energy to do it. Uh, and, and, and the other problem is that um, most of the House of Lords are people that Blair appointed from a left-wing socialist perspective. So when I, when I, I put the paper together, I worked for about 10 or 12 hours on it. it it's out on my website. It explains the issues. And I then went to it uh, on my way home uh, to a stationer's. And this very nice man behind the stationer said, so, Father, what have you been doing? I said rather proudly, I've been in the House of Lords. Why? Because of this sex ed thing for, for primary school children. Tell me about it. I said, well, we're protesting because it's not very good for children to be exposed too early on to sexualized uh, content and, and parents are having their freedom taken away from you. Well, I disagree with you, he said. I'm going to be a teacher next year. I disagree with you. 
So I said, you can't disagree with me. I'm not taking away your right. I'm saying you've misspoken. What you intend to say is I'm so committed to LGBT culture and its imposition, despite what anybody thinks, that I'm willing for our children to take a really big psychological hit as the price I want them to pay for it. So I said, you can say that to me, and that's true. You can't say you disagree with what, what, with what I've described. So he was a bit, he scratched his head and said, well, I disagree with you. Now, now the pro problem here is we're dealing with people in the street who've been brainwashed. This was a really nice, intelligent ethnic guy who wanted to have a conversation with one of his customers. And when presented with some facts, just rolled back the, the newspeak, the, the, the propaganda, um, and he's going to be a teacher and he'll impose these things on, on nine to five year olds. And where does this leave us? It leaves us with the death of a culture. And I don't, and, I, and George, you were saying in the priest's show chat earlier on that I mean, you made a really interesting point, which I hope you'll pick up now, which is that this huge cul de sac we've entered into culturally and politically is mirrored in the church, and nobody knows what to do. One of the, for me, more emotionally satisfying bits of this uh, gig, uh, just to shorten all shorten the phrases, is correspondence. Now, yes, people will write to uh, us with sort of, sort of silly comments, but we also get many, many letters and comments of people bewailing the situation they find themselves in. Mm -hmm. uh, we get numbers of letters from people in the Church in England and Church in Wales who write to us and say, the, the hierarchy, the establishment, they're almost like an occupying force. They, they have no relationship, no sense of who we are as worshippers of people. And listening to the debates of the, of the, the nation votes one way, but the House of Commons goes the other, it's that much of a disconnect between the hierarchy of the Church of England, beginning with the rural deans and the archdeacons and the suffragans and the bishops and the archbishops, between the believer and the pew, as there is between the, the Tory grandees who are telling the uh, people that you're not smart enough to know your best interest, Just sit down, shut up, and let us run the let us let Brussels run your country. Um, that. The, the, the divide between the political classes and the people, the divide between the religious elites and the people, as I don't think has been worse in the last, I don't know how long, well, certainly been, in the last century. There has been an exclamation point to the, the understanding that the government and the church doesn't understand itself and that England is falling apart. A person applied for asylum last week to... <laughs> England and the person who got the case read through it and saw that he's a Christian and for whatever reason he or she thought well let me give you my opinion of Christianity and this person denied the claim of uh, Christian persecution uh, to this claimant because and you can't come to our country England because Christianity is not a religion of peace and here's all the bible references to prove my point see this on one uh, level you could say this is just government pure incompetence no. i think there's something deeper there's a maliciousness yeah. well you have to follow the money the 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 motivation of the civil servant who did this was to present islam as a religion of peace and christianity as a religion of violence now i don't know the religion of the, of the civil servant who did that but it would be surprising if they had nothing to do with the sympathy for Islam. The extraordinary thing, thing was that at the level of mendacity uh, um, and uh, injustice, well, it's off the scale. It, well, it, it was off the scale because for the first time I've seen in two or three years, somebody in an official capacity of the Church of England said, wait a minute. They don't say wait a minute for anything. Paul, no, Paul, Paul God, God bless him. He made a very good speech. It yes, was it was did. excellent. He made this one mark. Can we can we credit this man? Yes, it's please. Not, Go on. <laughs> because Paul Butler made a made a, a, a very pithy statement in the House of Lords, and he said to, to, to use the Bible like this in a case like this is the equivalent 
of saying that because there is plastic in the sea, um, the uh, the whole concern for ecological purity is 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 completely wasted. I mean, you simply cannot make a link between one bad outcome and uh, a whole point of view so it, for, for, for the first time for a long long time a member of the church of england spoke up but to what effect the the, the, the problem is the uh, akin to uh, the polluted rivers of industrial philadelphia there have been generations upon generations upon generations of industrial waste seeping into the rivers such that the, to the depth of 20 feet the soil is contaminated we have seen that same contamination in our society, in our intellectual life, in our bureaucracies, in our churches, such that the institutions are still there, the river still flows, but there is death and no life. The Church of England is a, a dead institution. Uh, the, the, the home office is... This, this could be under Nazi Germany. This could be under the Soviet Union, the way these bureaucrats are operating, where evil is rewarded, where mendacity is the aim. It, the poison is so deep. Um, we've, we've, we've been berated by our critics, um, part with some justification, but I want to suggest a limited justification for talking about the problems and never providing a solution. I think George's earlier point that the that the what the church is going through is a microcosm of the of, of the global turmoil, the cultural breakdown, is very well made. And you know, none of us have any solutions to the Brexit issue, to the, the Trump Democrat issue, to the uh Islam migrant issue. We we don't have any solutions. But I think one of the things that's becoming clearer is that within Christianity, um the there is a there is a there are groups of people who want to be faithful to what we let's call it biblical apostolic christianity for a moment and then there's the there's the the people who are more tuned to culture and the roman catholics are having exactly the same struggle as we're having in anglicanism uh and, and there are a lot of faithful catholics who are saying we believe our church has been polluted by the spirit of the age if you go to the the Protestant side, there are many Pentecostals and people who are pneumatically energized who say we believe in biblical and apostolic Christianity and we don't accept the route that's been taken by liberal Protestantism. And within Anglicanism, you have that, both those being, uh, that, that split there too. So one of the things I've been pleading for is some time is a very serious change in our mental maps many of us understand are belonging to an, to an organization in terms of the history that sprung from 1500 to the present day, beginning with Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and encompassing the Tractarian movement and, uh, and then Vatican II and so on. But we need a new map. And, and, and on one side of the map, we're going to have biblical apostolic Christians who resist the zeitgeist. And on the other side, those who see themselves as bringing, as, as in any some kind of way, um, committed to the zeitgeist. That's the change. If there's going to be renewal in the church, a salvation of Christianity, it's going to be because apostolic biblical Christians get over their historic um, differences the last 500 years and reconfigure themselves to speak with the voice of conscience in the face of two juggernauts that are intended to deprive them of their conscience. One's Islam, one's Marxism. Hey, Gavin, I, I'm going to take a slight issue with you. We do know the answer, and that begins with personal transformation and personal holiness. We don't know the answer to Brexit. We don't know the answer to all these major issues, but we do know what we as individuals can do, what you, the viewer, can do, and that is seek ye first the kingdom of God. Yeah, absolutely. And at the end of the day, what I think or what I write or what I uh, imagine is the best course of action for any of these major issues is irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. But my salvation, my life, isn't irrelevant to me, nor should yours be to you. And the response is faithfulness, holiness. And where do we find that? We find that in the Bible, Gavin would add, and the sacraments. And that's the way forward. 
personal holiness, pers right. personal conversion and repentance. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Absolutely, that's the watchword. We are called to be holy. You know, irregardless of the news around us, the, those people who uh, throughout history, the martyrs, the faithful, all in their circumstance, don't kick your table like that. It's so <laughs> <It's getting cramped. laughs> like England has had an, an earthquake too. It's not just the, the politics, but we're called to be holy. R regardless of the circumstance we find ourselves in politically, financially, uh, emotionally, uh, spiritually, we are called uh, singularly to that. And we want to offer that encouragement as the, the co-host of Anglican Unscripted. You know, the news out there in, in this period of time for this moment is disheartening and it's bad, but uh, we all f as true believers find hope in Christ and now, find I hope in the fellowship that we have with each other, within our churches, uh, within the larger community of Christians in, the, in this world. And if things get a little worse, we're here. We're gonna we're gonna accept that call of holiness. If things get better, eh, we're still called to be holy. And I, I want to present that to you as the viewer. Now, what I want not to hear people say, I mean, that this is an exercise of self reliance, that we can save ourselves, <laughs> that through educating ourselves or becoming more conscious or all these things that we can somehow, by our own efforts, pull ourselves out of this hole. It's not what I'm saying. Uh, there's a, the American heresy is of uh, radical individualism. Now, on I'll, that's another topic for our show, but I'm not saying that by our own efforts we can save ourselves. We need to go to that higher point, which is Jesus Christ. You guys don't have smell of vision but it seems like Mrs. Ashenden just delivered a wonderful meal, and it's probably time for uh, Gavin to, to help sign off. But before we do that, um, Gavin, tell us a little bit about the ministry that people will be supporting if they financially uh, give to you at, at the link provided in the show notes. Yes, uh, one, of the, one of the things I have to do is to travel. So, I mean, uh, to, to, to get up to London uh, early enough for, for a meeting costs, um, costs 120 pounds. And um, uh, of course, when people invite me to do things, if they can, they pay my expenses. Of course they do. But, but many of the things that we're doing here are, um, you know, there, are no, there, there is nobody to pay expenses. I, I attended a GAFCON bishops meeting uh, yesterday. Uh, there is no budget for that. Um, I mean, the other people belong to organizations. So uh, p part of the, so if people do give and, and uh, um, there, there's a one, there's a, <laughs> I tried to raise some money for a wonderful old lady. She, she, she gives me a small amount of her pension, I, which I found very difficult to accept. But she said, if I don't give it to you, I'll give it to a cat's home. And the other day she was run over and she needs new teeth, new spectacles, new bicycle helmet. And I, I, I took all the money she'd give me and tried to give it back to her. Um, <laughs> the, the, it's always the same. It's the widow's, the widow's mites. Um, the, 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 the expenditure here is, is simply pragmatic. Uh, and, and I'm extremely grateful for people who offer out of their kindness. Somebody the other day tried to buy me a, a radio microphone in order to do morning prayer more effectively. Well, we got the wrong radio microphone, and it turns out it's really quite a problem matching Macintosh stuff to radio mics and we and and if you do it costs quite a lot of money but um, so insofar as people of their generosity feel the Holy Spirit's asking them to help that's wonderful because there's no other means of doing it all right so I you sent me the link already I'm gonna put them in the show notes so that uh, people can help out um, if you guys want to add comments please comment on this episode it's great uh, if you guys you know want to reach out uh, and send us personal emails I would certainly forward them on to Gavin and George uh, we appreciate the encouragement for the show that we do and we know that uh, um, you guys are out there praying for us and we really do appreciate that that's kind of the whole point of this isn't it I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden. You've been listening to 500 minus 4, 496 of Anglican Unscripted. God bless and keep you.